We are at the top of the hour, um, three o'clock here in the Eastern time zone. I want to welcome everyone, and I'm sure we will have additional colleagues join us as we uh, get started here. And I want to get Michelle going here as soon as possible. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you to Michelle and uh, let everyone know about all the hard work that you have done to even make this a possibility for well-connected communities and our work with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And if it hadn't been for your passion and perseverance and um, going the extra mile, we wouldn't be where we are today. So Michelle, thank you for your leadership in doing that and, and many, many thanks from all of us. So, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Rogers. Michelle is the Director of Extension in Delaware and she, more importantly, has been the leader um, for well-connected communities. And so Michelle, take it away. Well, thanks, Ed. And this has really been a system effort. So I want to give credit to uh, folks from 4-H National Council who have been so critical in partnering with us uh, to do this work and uh, those uh, on ECOP who have supported this effort as an initiative to bring some private resources into an extension system-wide effort. So uh, I appreciate the chance to uh, today and my goals for today are to um, introduce some of you who may not be familiar with it to Well-Connected Communities uh, along with an update. Uh, and then I'd like to share with you some learnings we've had in the first two years of the project, particularly as it relates to directors and system changes that we need to consider from a leadership perspective. And then finally, I wanna talk about uh, the next two years of uh, funding and our partnership with Robert Wood Johnson and the opportunities for more states to become involved in, in the project. So there are my objectives for the time we have uh, together, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk through this, but be uh, happy to answer questions as we go through or uh, at the end, um, uh, and I'll try and get through content and be very happy to answer questions both today and beyond today as, as people have, have questions. Um, before I get officially started on, on the content of my slides, I just want to say I just have returned uh, from Texas. Uh, Fort Worth, Texas, where we were having the National Health Outreach Conference, and thanks to our Texas A&M folks who hosted that conference. Uh, and uh, yesterday at that conference, I was able to provide three land-grant universities with awards that are supported by this Well-Connected Community Project. This was the first time for those, and I'll just share that the University of Arizona uh, received the Land-Grant University Award uh, for their work uh, and they're doing in the Tucson Village in a uh, pharmacy uh, project they have, and that pharmacy is spelled F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, uh, great program. Uh, we were able to recognize an adult volunteer, and uh, that is Jackie Rode from South Dakota, and she's working on, uh, she's from the uh, Crow Creek Sioux Tribe, and uh, she is working on smart lunchrooms and uh, stock healthy, shop healthy uh, programs uh, in South Dakota. And then uh, our Youth Development uh, a Volunteer Award went to Pearl um, Dascom, and Pearl is a 4-H'er uh, from uh, uh, Michigan uh, State University Extension. So uh, it was an honor. Uh, these are not necessarily, only one of those uh, awards went to a well-connected community land grant. So I want just to say this was a system-wide uh, recognition. Everybody had a chance to uh, be involved in that and uh, excited to recognize work that is going on around the system uh, around these factors. And uh, we had a nice amount of applicants from across the country in that and uh, glad to have those first ever awards. So when you're talking about something, a project, I think we've all learned that telling the story about that is probably one of the best ways uh, to um, introduce well-connected communities. So rather than just give you all the facts and figures on this, I would like to uh, tell you the uh, a story about one state that's involved in this project. Um, I've been involved in visiting um, the states uh, that have been funded on this project uh, on site visits and I was in Utah last week and so that one's fresh in my mind. And so I'd like to talk to you about three communities in Utah. And so first I'd like you to envision uh, the geography in the state of Utah and we're working in three communities uh, there in Utah and uh, the first one uh, is um, the uh, Davis County, which is just north of uh, Salt Lake City. And it is uh, a very 
County. Um, Pop is the most populated county, small geographically, uh, and the work that's being uh, done there in that county, uh, in that community in that county. And then we have uh, also um, the Emory County, uh, which is uh, south uh, and uh, south central uh, Utah. And in that community, they're dealing with poverty. Uh, they're also uh, dealing with uh, for being a former mining town and dealing with some unemployment issues that are there. Uh, and then we have the Fort Duchesne uh, and, uh, County that we uh, visited and where we were for the site visit. And uh, there they're working with the Ute tribe, uh, which is uh, in that area and has uh, over 3,000 tribal members, uh, over half of them which reside on the, uh, uh, the territory there. And they're looking at over a million acres of property and land that they are also managing as a tribal community and uh, their opportunities uh, and issues that they're dealing with. So I'd like to talk to you to tell you the story about these counties and uh, what's happening there. And uh, so I've given you the background in the counties and Mark, uh, if you move us to the next slide, I can show you uh, just some brief uh, work that's going on with these counties. Um, so Davis County, which I mentioned, uh, among its uh, county health rankings and roadmaps, one particular statistics uh, spoke to that community as they did the work there. They're averaging 17 suicide deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, and uh, among other health statistics, uh, the approach and the action item that their community is taking is, is uh, focusing on suicide prevention. In Emory County, which I spoke about, uh, they uh, are dealing with issues of um, uh, particularly opioid uh, in their community. And um, uh, they shared that when they had a community meeting, um, they asked uh, how many people in the audience of this community meeting knew or was impacted by someone they knew or loved um, that had been impacted by opioid situation. Every person in the room raised their hand and the only person that didn't raise their hand was one of our extension specialists that was coming from out of the county. So that's how big that issue is there. And so their uh, Well Connected Communities Project understandably is focused on substance misuse and mental health. And in Intaw County, uh, uh, which is the tribal community, they have a high percentage of adults who have diabetes and, and uh, a long-term issue of uh, dealing uh, with that uh, for the health and sake of the tribal community. So these uh, topics have all been identified through uh, bringing together a coalition of youth and adults uh, who have identified and looked at the data and have identified what things that they want to work on. So you have a little bit about, about the background and a little bit about what um, they're working on. So before I get uh, further into that, let me just give you uh, some overview of the, the, whole, um, the whole piece of this. So if you move to the next slide, I just give you just the big picture now of uh, well-connected communities uh, is a partnership of Cooperative Extension through ECOP uh, and uh, it is uh, su supported through National 4-H Council from the grant management perspective of that uh, and also some of the subcontract work that we are doing uh, to build capacity in the extension system. And, uh, and we are uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest philanthropic uh, health organization in the country. Um, so uh, you can see that in the first two years of this uh, project initiative that we've been working on, we have uh, 39 communities total that are, a bit, are involved in um, this project. And that's three for each of the states that are highlighted that are involved. Four of them are in large communities. Uh, three of them are in mid-sized communities. And uh, the majority of them, as uh, desired, are in these rural uh, communities. Um, that we're working with. And rural health is a real uh, issue and concern uh, that uh, in particular I feel extension is well placed to address. There's been over 330 trained youth leaders involved uh, in this project thus far and we're, we're tracking that and that continues to grow. And we've had 13 active university partnerships that are, that are involved. What each of these uh, institutions are involved in doing is establishing a local coalition uh, within the community that they have identified that have particular health needs that I've just described to you, and establishing a coalition that is both youth and adult uh, in makeup, and is a multi-sector collaborative uh, with lots of um, 
folks from across the, um, the assets that are in that community that can come together around that. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, you can see the kind of key partners that we have in this initiative. Uh, we have community members um, who are um, volunteers in many ways, uh, serving in these uh, coalitions. Uh, we have nonprofit organizations, and this graph is by the percentage of them that is uh, in this. Um, we also have healthcare providers, government agencies, K-12 education, and college and university uh, partners in this. Uh, a few of these were uh, adding, continuing to add to these coalitions and adding the medical community um, uh, with that uh, specifically um, as well. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see some of the um, areas in terms of where we are with this coalition development and recognizing that community development work isn't even no matter when we start or stop this project. Some of these communities are just uh, starting a, a coalition and in a couple communities, they're still working to establish that, that coalition uh, together. Uh, it's sometimes very challenging with some of the cultural uh, opportunities that we're working with uh, to even have the trust in a new community where we may not have worked before to have established the trust and uh, the long-term relationship that we want to establish that coalition. We have uh, some of our coalitions who are joining an existing coalition that was in place and broadening that perspective uh, around the health uh, arena. And then we have uh, active and sustained coalitions that we are working with, but helping to add the youth component to that coalition. So uh, this is who we are working with in the 39 communities currently in place. On the next slide, you can see the priority areas uh, of the focus of these projects. Um, the, uh, you can see we're working uh, in the largest area that we have of the action items that the coalition has identified for work. Um, we have a lot around healthy eating and active living, the largest uh, percentage, but uh, that's no surprise as we're doing a lot of this uh, work in some of our uh, communities in combination with the SNAP education effort that we do and where we already have uh, coalitions around uh, healthy eating and active living. But as you heard from the beginning, there are many other topics that are being uh, identified and they're categorized as uh, substance abuse prevention, uh, some youth engagement uh, in terms of youth leading a, a particular role in a community, food access and environment, and some mental health and healthcare access are, are all topics um, across the 39 communities. And each of them has selected in, in one of those categories. Um, and on the right side, you can see the many different ways these communities have been involved through stakeholder meetings, focus groups, uh, looking at pop population health data, um, interviews and surveys. Um, the very first uh, part of this project has really been about uh, doing our extension work in a little bit different way. It's really been about engaging in the community, getting to know the community, the county health rankings and roadmaps, and having, making decisions about where to move forward with that. Uh, based on the community deciding what the action item is. We're not coming in with a program or curriculum. We're coming in with needs assessment and helping a community uh, facilitate a community conversation around what they would like to approach. So as you go to the next slide, I'll come back to my stories about these communities and tell you a little bit about where we've been uh, since then. I discussed, shared with you Emory County, and Emory County is the county that had the concern with opioids. Uh, and they started with a total youth coalition. It started with one adult and one youth. Uh, and uh, the young woman to, on the left of the picture uh, is the uh, early on uh, provider of, uh, of this coalition work and has really um, expanded that. And it's been a wonderful example of youth leadership. And they started with a countywide meeting to talk about the statistics in their county about this opioid. And that's where the question came, how many of you have been impacted? Uh, and uh, that was what it started and they had invited the local pharmacist to come into their coalition meeting and talk about the dangers of irresponsible prescription drug use and how to dispose of drugs properly and uh, just begin the conversation uh, and education within their community. The youth coalition then uh, started adding some adults who were interested in the topic and joining with them. And then the next thing they did is they went to a meet the candidate night um, as part of um, the election process that was in place. 
and the youth then ask each of the candidates questions about how they would be addressing and tackling the issue of the opioid crisis that was in their country. And so the youth had a great opportunity to be engaged uh, in the citizenship piece uh, of their work. And that uh, uh, said a lot to the candidates, including a sheriff, who I'll talk about in a minute. The teens then had an uh, opportunity from the coalition to attend a governor-sponsored opioid uh, symposium that was really uh, an important kickoff for them and uh, helped them to realize, uh, along with the Youth Health Summit that we held uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, that they were empowered to make a difference and to impact um, their community. So the sheriff, who I spoke of, that had uh, originally come to the coalition, been part of the candidates' night, um, was um, not necessarily supportive when the coalition determined that they were going to uh, provide NARCAM and NARCAM training uh, in the community. And um, he was not necessarily supportive of that, but he also didn't uh, prevent it from happening. Uh, so they went ahead and had the training, and indeed, uh, within the first week of the training, they had three uh, individuals who um, were um, saved through this uh, NARCAM um, rescue um, piece that they had uh, helped to put in place in the community. But more so than that, it was a real turning point for the sheriff, who has now come back to this youth coalition and asked um, them to help him to really work at this issue in the community. And he has asked them to do uh, work in the school uh, and where they're at. And here's the sheriff, <laughs> you can spot him and the youth and uh, partnering together in the schools uh, to address this issue uh, as the youth uh, engage with that. And he starts out by asking them just to be a friend to others and helping them uh, to see the way. The best story of all with this is one of the youth represented here uh, has a brother who is addicted and he shared with the coalition that by being in this, involved in this coalition, he could see a path forward that was different than what his brother had taken and it gave him great encouragement to be surrounded by uh, his peers who were working in this area. So that's uh, where uh, Emory County is with that and their work uh, and what they've accomplished in the past 18 months. Next, we have the Duchesne and Intah counties and that slide uh, mark is next to where you can see some of these youth and here we are dealing with the, the tribal community and they started their work with a diabetes prevention coalition that was already in place. Diabetes has already been identified by the tribe as being an important issue for that. But what they did was develop a youth uh, some coalition around this to help work on that. And uh, the youth's goal right up front is they're going to change the tribal policy and uh, build sidewalks and uh, make environmental changes in the community. And um, it was a, a, another lesson in citizenship as they discovered it was not so easy uh, just to change policy and build sidewalks. But they have begun with uh, other ways to begin that work and they have um, built some birdhouses and they now have weekly walks around the community and they are joined by um, most of the community now on day, certain days and certain times and the community is now walking together and they put these birdhouses around the walking path and motivational signs. And uh, that has uh, really gotten the community started to think about this. And it's probably the first step, no pun intended, in uh, moving towards what will later become some policy change about establishing sidewalks uh, and making a, a place for physical activity in their community. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you'll see some of the youth who were involved in a symposium that they've had uh, where they've been working at um, providing some education, nutrition education around uh, diabetes and uh, who doesn't like the blender bike and the previous picture you saw the kids in the blender bike and the staff here working on some uh, community uh, educational efforts that they're having as well. And finally in Davis County um, where uh, we focused on uh, the suicide uh, issues and on the next slide you'll see uh, some of the community members and the coalition members talking about community gardening, but where they really uh, rested their efforts was on um, teen Latino uh, suicide prevention. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, one of the most populated counties, but they really saw the need for this. And so they have initiated the mental health first aid um, with a culturally responsive approach um, that they're trying to build into that with a special sensitivity to uh, this culture and what um, this means. Um, they're now meeting monthly and they have youth serving on the, on the coalition. 
And one of the outcomes of their effort is because they now have a coalition around this, the coalition has been successful in applying for a SAMHSA grant and they have brought in over $360,000 into their community for a culturally responsive youth mental first aid um, program. So uh, the coalition has really um, worked to bring that uh, together for everyone. So there are the stories, uh, just three of the communities of the 39 that we're working with. Uh, and they would uh, share with you that um, it's community development work from the get-go, that we have a lot to learn about cultural sensitivity and working in different cultures. Um, and it's different than going in with a program, an educational uh, program and saying, here we are with our program in and out. But this is about, uh, I think, what the grassroots of Extension has always been, going into a community, assessing need, uh, asking community to be engaged with them, bringing the resources of the university to bear on the community, connecting those resources in the community, and having the community itself own uh, the action and the changes that are happening. So uh, I, I'm pleased to say that Robert Wood Johnson is very uh, pleased with our first two year efforts. And we are now beginning planning for um, the next, what we call wave, the next two years of this initiative uh, supported by Robert Wood Johnson. So on the next slide, uh, I wanna share with you some of the key pivot points uh, of this um, program. And uh, one of the things that we uh, know that we need to do based on our experience is really have some equity strategies in place and cultural um, competencies and effectiveness uh, in terms of working with different communities. Uh, we're very clear on the power of youth and um, the, um, that's been very helpful. Uh, in terms of that, we uh, also recognize that we're doing a lot of network weaving across communities that this has been a, a monumental opportunity for youth adult partnership. And um, we're also, um, one major point you'll see it in yellow is we've been really encouraged by Robert Wood Johnson to really think about policy, systems and environment changes that we can make at the community level and at um, the um, state level and at the national level in our cooperative extension organization to support this kind of work. And we've also addressed some of the issues that some of our states uh, have had initially around the tobacco separation protocol that's part of this project. Um, none of the staff working on it can be funded by tobacco um, money, tobacco settlement money. And so uh, we have um, had greater understanding of that and uh, being able to talk about how uh, to extend that forward as we move uh, forward. So on the next slide, I just want to introduce this idea um, because this is a systems level conversation. We talk about policy with a small p and with a large p. And that um, the leadership for extension, uh, those of us in director's role really have an opportunity to help uh, with this work in our system. Mark, on the next slide, if you would, uh, I talk about the small p and the big p. Um, our staff as a whole across this project I can speak of, really when we talk about policy, think very much about big P, the laws, the ordinances, the comprehensive plans. And uh, you heard me mention about the Fort Duchesne community where the kids just were gonna come in and, and uh, establish these sidewalks, not recognize all the laws and so forth that had to be uh, changed. The big policy things would have to be addressed. But for the most part, our staff really do think of policy as that big, uh, big piece and what has to uh, be accomplished. And we have examples for us, you know, we think of the Farm Bill in our organization as a very big policy that influences our work. What we've really been encouraged to think about with this project is the small P um, and that many of the small P's, the small policy efforts really lead to the big policy. And these are things that are in the, uh, in the community level, like the schools deciding to uh, um, only stock non-sugar drinks uh, in their vending machines. Or um, uh, it might be that uh, a community changes, um, uh, in a community club, we change what we uh, serve as healthy snacks uh, for our club meetings. So Robert Wood Johnson, as we move forward, has really encouraged us as a system uh, to think about uh, this work in policy, uh, how long it takes that we may only see small P's, small policy work at the beginning, but um, that ultimately it will lead to big, 
big policy and in our action planning in these communities that we will think long term what policy impact do we want to have and in our extension organization to think about what policies we may need to change and implement so that we can further support this kind of work. Does our promotion and tenure process, um, for example, support agents who are working at this community development level and aren't having knowledge, attitude, skills, and aspiration changes necessarily, but are having these larger uh, system changes uh, around the community that aren't always um, as easily to develop? And are we establishing ways to document and, and uh, support uh, those kind of changes? So I just bring that uh, to your attention. On the next slide, uh, I have some examples of some of the policy changes that have been happening in our coalitions. Um, I'm very happy to say the small P's that they've been doing is a, a number of our coalitions have broadened their policy around participation of youth and have uh, come to recognize the value of that. Um, they've developed an annual summit around opioids. Uh, farmer markets have changed their policy to accept the SNAP um, uh, vouchers for that. A big policy change that has happened is one of the tribal uh, councils, and uh, this would be the Fort Duchesne, uh, I think I got that right, um, yeah, the Fort, now I had the wrong state, South, in South Dakota, one of the tribal councils. They have adopted a policy on a system of care approach for organizations working with the council. So many folks have come into that community and say they're going to help them bring a program or project in, and then it's come and go. And so um, with well-connected communities and with recognizing the value of that uh, around policy change, they have put in together a policy that says, if you come in with a program for us, come with a system of care of other community partners, come through the coalition uh, and we'll, we'll work on that. So they have changed some of their policy uh, to make that work. Uh, we have policy changes at the food pantry about having choice and having um, some, some donation boxes. So they're just some of the examples. And I just share that we've also uh, done some uh, evaluating of what has changed at the land grant university. And on, on the next slide, um, we have some examples of how the, the um, staff have identified changes in our system. One of the big ones is recognition of just the need to uh, uh, integrate across the program lines. And in particular, uh, initially the family and consumer science um, staff and the 4-H staff have really come to value what each other can bring and that each is a, a valuable part of this coalition work. I would add we have some, uh, a few states who have added their ag agents to this effort and are bringing that in and that's been very uh, powerful in that community as well as uh, community development staff who bring their expertise in facilitating uh, these conversations and networking to this. So, um, that's a system level change that we're beginning to see about this. Uh, we're seeing understanding uh, of agent staff around and specialists around this idea that work in the community is not just coming in with direct education, but they, we need to make this long-term investment uh, in, in getting community engagement. Um, we have some places uh, where we're changing our reporting system to include collaboration uh, as a part of that and to document that as a valuable um, a tool uh, in this work. And uh, we have some uh, that are beginning to think about what constitutes health work and the very broad definition of health that's beyond uh, food and nutrition but gets into this place-based community work. It might be around uh, violence uh, prevention. Uh, it might be um, the opioid prevention, it could be just a broad range of, it could be mental health, behavioral health, and that health is really a broad range of things, much broader than just maybe nutrition and health where we have focused uh, in the past. So these are some of the policy changes um, that are happening in our system as a result of the project. I think that's um, very timely. So before I go into what's uh, coming next, I just want to pause for a moment um, and uh, just ask if there are any questions about um, the, pro the initiative and what we're doing and how we're doing that, or any other questions about um, some of the, the changes and pivots that we're planning to make as we move forward. Any questions for Michelle at this time? Don't be shy. <laughs> Feel free to type them in the chat, pad, the chat pad or otherwise as well. 
uh, and uh, be glad to, to follow up uh, and respond to any questions that you have. But let's go to the next slide. And while you're thinking of things you may want to ask, and this may uh, really bring the questions out when I talk about what's ahead. And so we're getting ready uh, at this point. Um, we're doing a couple of things. Uh, our grant year officially ends in May of this year. And we're asking for a no cost extension, which takes us through September uh, to wrap up some of the um, things that uh, we haven't gotten accomplished in this first wave that we had hoped to do and uh, particularly for our communities um, who have need more time to um, spend their funds in the communities where they're working. Uh, and then we are asking Robert Wood Johnson for some bridge funding uh, that will take us from September through December, uh, where the goal is to assist um, our funds. We have eight states that funded themselves in this project. And we uh, wanna pay attention to those and bring them on board as wave one states and give them some technical assistance uh, that helps them um, uh, meet some of the expectations of things they'd like to do um, in, in that time frame, as well as preparations that we need to do around the launch of wave two. So our grant proposal will go in uh, to Robert Wood Johnson. Um, we have the first draft of that due at the end of this month. And by um, July, that is uh, several reiterations of that are done with our partner. And um, we will um, are going to move ahead uh, with our RFA for uh, institutions to become involved as we move forward, um, despite not having the assurance of what those grant dollars are going to be, so that when we get those grant dollars, we can move forward. So we are going to release the RFA for wave two. Uh, our goal is we'd like to have 25 institutions. Uh, involved in that. That's uh, a goal, again, till we get our, um, everything's, uh, you know, what we hope to do until we uh, get the dollar amounts and things finalized. I can't be assured of that. But our goal is that we'd have 25 institutions. Um, each institution that's currently involved will reapply. They have a slightly different application because we are aware of their communities and what they're doing. Current institutions, the 13 current institutions that have been involved in wave one, are asked to add at least one new community and up to three. Uh, and this is considerable uh, give on Robert Wood Johnson. They've recognized the time that we've invested in this and the time that it's taking. And so originally we were going to uh, double the, from three communities up to six in each state, but we're really getting some recognition from them of the time and effort. And so we're gonna say a minimum of one community and up to three. That RFA will be out in June. We'll do some uh, webinars around that. Uh, and then in September, um, that will be due back and we'll hopefully be providing some technical assistance uh, to states around that application process. They'll come in in early September. And then in October, and, and we'll get them out to reviewers and get them reviewed. And then in October, the full board meets uh, Robert Wood Johnson and they will vote on our proposal. And uh, because we are doubling our request for the proposal this year, uh, it needs to go before the full board. And uh, that's the next opportunity we have to have uh, that proposal approved. And then following that, this gives us time to get contracts set up with each of the institutions involved and to, to move forward with that in 2020. So um, uh, that's uh, the time frame that we're working with. Um, we uh, have really had a number of conversations about how best to support um, our 1890 colleagues in this. And we at one time had floated the idea of a position in this process, if it was a partner between institutions. And what we're saying is we will uh, specifically want to fund two additional 1890s um, uh, with this next round uh, to support um, some special needs that are there as we move forward. And we're um, and particularly also encouraging states to consider partnering. Uh, if there's an 1890, an 1862, or a 1994, um, we're uh, encouraging states to see what is the best configuration, what's the best opportunities for uh, that work to be done together. On the next sl slide, I just talk about the university commitment if you come into this. Um, if you're a first, if this is the first time coming into the grant, you'll be asked to uh, provide two FTEs. And uh, as we launch the RFA, we'll give more information about how states have done that. But in general, that's been a portion of multiple people from both the 4-H, Ag, Community Development, FCS time, uh, SNAP-Ed. Uh, it's been multiple people who have fulfilled those two FTEs. It hasn't been 
two people fully taken out of something else and working in this. And uh, be happy to pair you with other states and share how they have been doing that. For wave one institutions that had previously been funded, we're asking for 2.5 FTEs as they move forward. And we're finding they're, they're, um, they're putting that into it as we move forward. Um, as I said, if you're new to this, a wave, a wave two state and just coming in, you'll be asked to work with three communities uh, and, um, and what uh, up to six in that. Um, we'll ask you to participate in the training of the launch of this, which we'll do one national training uh, is what we're, we're planning as a launch and then we do a lot by webinar, uh, a lot by distance, and that will be part of the funding that's provided in the grant. Uh, but you do need to attend and come and be a part of that. So we want to be upfront about that. Our partner requires that we have this tobacco separation protocol. Uh, it's a written statement. And then those who are funded agree to quarterly uh, update that protocol and indicate that they, uh, the salaries of the folks involved on the grant uh, they're being, uh, are not funded through tobacco. And we have a standard letter that just is used and a sign off that comes from your research office on that. But that's an important partner uh, aspect. We will be updating um, what was our tobacco uh, separation protocol. Uh, in the first round, we've been, been informed by the work that we've done, and we will have updated uh, Q&A about that for the future. And uh, finally, uh, we will have requirement that institutions uh, do a quarterly reporting into the dashboard which uh, you'll be able to see, which some of that data that I shared with you is from our dashboard, and that universities will have up to 10% indirect F&A uh, that can be included uh, in your submission. So let me just stop there. I see there's a couple questions. Um, and Lila, you've asked, are there a specific process that's provided? Um, uh, is that up to each institution uh, in terms of the community coalition building? And so uh, the answer to that is that we do provide and are providing as part of the training um, and the technical support uh, help along uh, the coalition building. Uh, it's one place that our community development uh, educators uh, help us a great deal, but we do have resources uh, that we're providing and that are in our resource toolkit around coalitions. They are each unique. Um, all, Every project that we have is unique to that community. And so there are ideas and we're doing a lot of peer sharing. And so this idea is really good. We're finding that the communities have welcomed when we've had these state gatherings uh, within the state that the communities can share with each other what they're learning. And also that we're doing that by distance, uh, having these learning communities as they share with each other what's been successful, what hasn't worked uh, and share that across their community. So uh, Lila, some good questions I hope that answered. Um, Chuck, your question about um, what current institutions have invested in the project over and above the grant. So um, the ways that they have invested, of course, is the, the FTEs, the staff who are involved, and that varies by institution. Um, but in all cases, I'm sure we're getting those, those two FTEs that are being provided um, by the self-funded states. Um, they've also paid um, for um, youth to attend the health summit. Uh, some other things that were covered um, for the funded states and um, any work that they have invested in community coalitions. So this has varied um, from state to state and uh, I certainly can uh, talk to those uh, uh, eight states that are in this situation and can gather that um, um, and can talk about it. I also can share that, uh, for example, in my state, uh, which has been involved in self-funding this, we know that um, the question I did ask and did measure is how much money has come into the communities as a result of us doing this work. And uh, we have estimated in uh, Delaware that we've have had over $100,000 come back into our three communities that we're working in. Some of that has come back directly to us in the forms of support for uh, training in the community um, and uh, community organizations that have funded extension to do some of the trainings around some of the topics that we're working in. So um, I, I don't have a specific answer, Chuck, but feel free to question me back and uh, get further detail on that. Uh, Michelle, this is Mark. Uh, what are some of the observations that you, you had, that you, you had, or actually some of the characteristics that you've seen in, let's say, 
individuals that uh, that volunteered or either participated with uh, with our uh, university colleagues in the project. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of community-based people that was really that really helped make the program a success. Well, I, one of the main ways that some of these communities um, volunteers have been most successful is we're calling them um, um, guide. We're calling them cultural guides. Okay. Um, so, in particular, and when we're working in communities where we may not be representative, and our extensive staff are not representative of that culture or that community, these mm -hmm. volunteers are serving as cultural guides and guiding us. Um, that, gee, we want to do these things. Um, we're, we had this expectation uh, of this program, and that's um, really not um, culturally sensitive uh, to that particular community. I'm trying yeah. to think. Uh, yesterday, I had some sharing from Minnesota, and I'm trying to think the exact example they gave of uh, where they went into a community, and it was our expectation um, that the the whole family would be involved in in something, and and it didn't fit with the culture there. And so, how were we designing it? Uh, wasn't helpful. So these um, one particular way the volunteers have been helpful is guiding us, the cultural guides uh, in this okay. process. Um, okay. uh, they've also they're serving on these coalitions. They're leading the initiatives. They're making contacts, um, and most of them have implemented some kind of community action item that's led by volunteers rather uh, than extension staff. Okay. So they've been very engaged. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Mark. Good question. Are there other questions? And, and if you're on your phone, you may have to hit star six to unmute um, to be able to ask them. So but feel free. Okay. Well, let's just, is it just one or two slides yet. Uh, Mark, if you can move it to uh, the next slide. I just want to say in states that are considering getting involved, uh, you do need to select at least one community. If you're coming forward and thinking about this, we ask that at least one community to be in the rural area. Uh, and um, we also ask that the others be rural or urban based based on um, the statistics area classification. Um, and I need to say that I'm talking about the word community. Um, I'm not talking about county, and we do so much by county that I say this and everybody thinks county because you have agents assigned by county, but here we're talking about communities. So in some cases, when I, today when I talk about Utah, they are in a county, but it's a select community within that county. So it's not necessarily a community that's the whole county wide, but maybe uh, a, a specific community such we have, Sussex County is our largest Southern Delaware County, but our coalition, uh, and particularly for this project, is working with the community of Seaford, which is one of those communities uh, that's really struggling with opioids. So uh, Philadelphia is working on their project is with the Norris Square, uh, which is a particular part of the city that they are working with. So uh, that's what we're doing with that. Um, so it is community. Uh, and um, we do ask, as you identify those communities, that they are experiencing lower than state averages for life expectancy or it's considered, another way that said is premature death um, uh, for that community. And that's in the county health rankings and roadmap um, information. So that helps states to determine where they might wanna do this and what staff um, might be best situated to know those communities and to work with that. Finally, uh, on the following slide, I just wanna draw your attention to resources you have for your state. Um, this is um, the Well Connected Communities website um, it's wellconnectedcommunities.extension.org. Um, our extension um, program has helped to establish this as our resource base page for that. Community Cares is the organization we contract with out of Missouri Extension, who helps develop and uh, provide the structure for the web page. But why I want to draw your attention to it is every one of these communities has a page now on this web page tells their community story, what they're doing, what coalition members they have involved, and you can find a great deal and learn about how this might apply in your state by looking at that. But secondly, um, we have uh, on these websites, um, and, and the last slide, if we uh, turn that mark, uh, on this website, we have resources um, that your states can consider. So on wellconnectedcommunities.extension.org, uh, in particular, there are two uh, webinars. 
uh, that are recorded there. One called Readiness for Well-Connected Communities, which I really recommend uh, for your state to uh, review and consider uh, as uh, it's aimed at uh, helping states uh, to consider uh, their readiness to do this work and what that might involve. And the second webinar is around unlocking potential, engaging young people in community change, and is really another excellent uh, example. Um, we have really learned in this first two years that the youth are really making a difference um, in being the catalyst for change in these. And this talks about uh, this and it, uh, this effort and about the youth adult partnership and how we uh, would need to um, figure that in our, into our uh, efforts as we're doing that. So I really recommend these resources that we have put in place to be helpful uh, for states as you consider going forward. Uh, Jeff is asking about what level of funding for state comes with the Wave 2 grant. Um, I can't speak to that yet um, because we don't have this budget issue resolved with Robert Wood Johnson. I can speak to what it has been in Wave 1. Um, in wave one, it has been uh, $90,000 over the two year time frame. Uh, each state has used those funds um, as they've needed. Some have given grants uh, to their communities. Some have used it for um, these cultural guides or some coordinator kind of um, assistance, somebody who's in the community who can help uh, reach out and get the, the uh, coalition together. Um, that's been used for um, travel. Uh, some of these communities are very far away from uh, uh, university and bringing faculty and specialists to that. Uh, it's been used for that. Uh, and so each state develops their own budget and the use for these funds um, that come with that. And then there are additional funds that have been from the grant that come to the state. Other things like all the web resources, all the uh, capacity building around um, uh, professional development, we're offering several things uh, every month. Uh, and technical assistance, we have one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Um, as people have difficulty with coalitions, we have our, uh, our coaches who uh, work with each of the uh, communities. So in, in pure cash, there, there has been that dollar amount, uh, but there has been additional investments that are made um, on, the, on the national level and then are coming out to those communities in particularly in professional development in um, and uh, capacity building resources. Um, and there's been some things around marketing. We've provided t-shirts with the logo. We've developed the logo. We're developing um, uh, tools um, that can be used in the state's community assessments and those kinds of things. So once we get the, um, I don't have the dollar amount uh, and we won't until we we will be submitting a budget to RWJ. We'll have an idea of what that will be. I expect that it will be similar um, going forward. Uh, we are trying to double um, our state. So depending on what level we're funded when this comes back, uh, our goal is really about 10 million. Uh, when this comes back, um, then we'll be able to work, you know, do we have more communities, more money? Uh, how do we, how do we um, aim that? But uh, we're working off of this year's model as a, a good starting place. Well, Michelle, thank you very much for the presentation as well as all the work that you have done. Are there, are there other questions? We have a couple of minutes if there are other questions for Michelle. As you recall, this has been recorded and will be available. The link will be going up and be a part of the um, Extension Monday Minute um, in, uh, in a week or two and uh, will be accessible and you can share with other folks that um, in, with your institution that may be instrumental in making some things happen. So we, uh, we hope you'll uh, look into and be prepared for wave two as we try to expand the number of institutions involved and the number of communities that are served, which is the ultimate goal. Right. And I'm happy to be a resource for anyone if you have questions and as a director as, uh, in particular, the other states that have been involved, I think the directors will be happy to speak to that as well. Um, so just know that we have lots of resources and, and uh, we're very excited about demonstrating how extension uh, is working in the local community, right at that community level needs, 
but how we're being able to uh, compile this upwards into a national saying that the extension system nationally is making this different across communities across the country. And so we're really hoping um, our institutions will step up and be part of this wave too and um, demonstrate how we move this more into a, a systems level um, uh, capacity. Absolutely. Last chance. Don't forget That's if you have to unmute your phone, I'll give you one more second in case you're trying to ask a question. Not hearing anything. Again, thank you, Michelle. And thanks to thank all you. of the engaged and well-connected communities. And we look forward to the success of wave two. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you very much.